Now we'll talk about the joints. There are three parts to this lecture. We'll first discuss the classification of joints, then go specifically into the synovial type of joints, and finally we will cover some specific synovial joints and in more detail. So do we'll begin with joint classification. The broad and basic definition of a joint is when two bony structures meet. Thus, the degree of movement at such a junction can range from immobile to freely moving. There are two methods to classify the types of joints. One is based on the motion allowed by the joint or functional. The other is the classification that involves the type of tissue in the joint. This lecture will follow the functional classification listed on the left. The three types of function classifications begin with a synarthrosis joint, which are immovable. Amphiarthrosis has some slight movement, but is more structural. Finally, the freely moving joints we think of as our shoulder, elbow, etc., are the diarthrosis joints. These are contained within joint capsules and have a wide range of movements. Synarthroses do not allow for movement. Whether fibrous or cartilaginous, interlocking bones may be confused together over time as it occurs in the skull. There are four main groups of synarthritic joints. Sutures are bones whose edges interlock like puzzle pieces to form the skull. Synchondroses are joints that use hyaline cartilage to make their connection as occurs between the ribs and sternum or in the growth plates of kids. These growth plates in kids, which are the epiphyseal plates, become fused bone known as epiphyseal line, which is a synostosis joint. Finally, the teeth are being held by ligaments in the bone of the upper and lower jaw or maxilla and mandible. These are the gonfoses. All of these are immovable joints with the overall classification of synarthritic joints. For our class, you only need to know examples of synarthritic joints such as sutures in the skull or teeth in the jaw. Don't worry about the names of these subcategories. Amphiarthroses are connections with some movement between adjacent bones. One of these slightly movable joints are syndesmoses, which are two bones side by side, as in the forearm or lower leg. They are not meant to move against each other, but their connection allows for some give to accommodate stresses placed on these regions. Another type is the synthesis, which contains a fibrocartilage connection. These are found along the vertebral column with fibrocartilage discs between adjacent vertebrae, as well as the anterior pelvis, where our two hip bones come together. The third classification is diarthroses, which are more familiarly known as synovial joints. These are freely movable and will be discussed in more detail in the next section. So in this first section, you are responsible for knowing the three functional classifications of joints and an example of each one. Don't worry about the subclasses, just know what the examples are of the three main classifications. Synovial joints. So this is the third group in the functional classification. We will discuss the features and movements or motions of synovial joints. Synovial joints have all this in common. They are contained in a capsule and therefore have a cavity within. These joints are also freely movable, although depending on the bony structures, their specific movements and range of motions can vary. A rule of thumb is the more flexible or greater range of motion of a joint the less stable it is. Your shoulder versus your hip, for example. Hyaline cartilage covers the ends of bones facing inside a synovial joint. The space between two bones are the synovial cavity surrounded by a membrane that secretes synovial fluid, which acts as an oily lubricant within this space. Outside, this cavity is reinforced with strong ligaments that form connections from the periosteum of each bone to hold the joint together. Let's look at each of these components more closely. The portions of bone within the joint is protected by a covering made of hyaline cartilage. These 
images indicated here are either plastinated specimens, as seen here, or raw specimens in the unpreserved state. We can see the cartilage, the smooth cartilage surface, although this one has some dings from a scalpel when this was being removed, but otherwise you can see the other smooth surfaces. Um, we can see the smooth surface here, as well as some of the smooth surfaces on the ends of bone. The synovial cavity in the black shaded region of the diagram is considered to be a space, but it is a very narrow space between the bones. The outer edges I indicated in red are the synovial membrane that produces the fluid within. Inside the synovial cavity is the oily fluid that acts as a lubricant for joint movement as well as provide nutrients to tissues within the joints as these joints are not very vascular. Synovial joints have one or more of these accessory structures for support or protection. In the knee joint, we have two fibrocartilage discs. This is the meniscus and is used to cup the rounded distal surfaces of the femur, stabilizing the joint, in addition to playing a role in shock absorption. These discs are wide around the periphery of the joint surface and taper toward the central region. More uniform fibrocartilage discs are found between adjacent vertebrae in the vertebral column for weight distribution and shock absorption. Fat pads can be found around some joints to protect by absorbing and distributing force. Bursa are little pillows of synovial fluid surrounded by a tough membrane that are found in areas where there is a great deal of motion and or number of tendons and these serve to prevent friction. On these MRI images, you can clearly see the fat pads outside of the knee. Fluid-filled bursa are shown in black. Tendons are a muscle-to-bone connection. These are found across joints, as it is this relationship that causes the joints to move. Ligaments are bone-to-bone -bone connections that are used to strengthen the joints. Synovial joints have several subgroups based on their shape and movements. In this diagram, we can see the different types of synovial joints, an example of where they can be found in the body. Plane joints glide across each other with limited movement, although they are synovial joints. One example is between the sternum and the clavicle or collarbone on either side. Hinge joints, like a door hinge, with one bone rotating around the other in a uniaxial plane. The best example of this is the elbow joint. Saddle joints are two interlocking joints, one concave and the other convex. The base of the thumb is a prime example of this type of joint. Condyloid joints are similar to a ball and socket joint, but with more limited movements. The relationship between the radius in your forearm and the wrist is an example of this type of joint. Pivot joints have one bone twisting within a space, like that that occurs between the first two vertebrae in the spinal column to produce the side-to-side -side motion for your head in the motion for no. Finally, the ball and socket joints are what most people think of when they think of joint examples in our body, such as shoulder or hip joint. It has one rounded head that fits into a concave cup. The shoulder has a greater range of motion because the cup portion is very shallow, while the socket or cup portion of the hip joint is much deeper and more limiting in the range of motion. This is a list of movements that occur at synovial joints. We'll go through each of these terms and describe the motion they represent. Flexion and extension are about the angle at a joint. When you close the angle, it is flexion. When you open it up, it is extension. Easy for the elbow or knee, bending either of these joints is flexion and straightening them out is extension. For the arm moving at the shoulder or leg moving at the hip or the torso itself, it's a little less obvious. In these three instances, motion forward is flexion, tilting your chin down, bending forward at the waist, or swinging your straight leg or arm forward is also flexion. For extension, you're moving back, moving your torso back or your straight leg back behind you or your straight arm 
behind you as well. Abduction is moving a limb away from the midline. Adduction is bringing it back in. Like a jumping jack, abduction is when you swing your arms and legs out to the side away from your body. Adduction is bringing them back in so your legs are pressed together and your arms are back by your side. One minor variation is your fingers and toes. Their midline is considered the middle of the hand or foot. So splaying your digits apart is abduction and bringing your fingers and toes back together is adduction. Circumduction is making a circle where the distal part moving makes a large circle around a single axis point. You can do this with your arm making big circles and the stationary axis point is the shoulder. Each of your fingers, with the exception of your thumb, also moves in a circular motion or circumduction. Rotation, however, is when something pivots along a single axis. The best example is turning your head in the gesture for no. Or your arms and legs can also do this with your arms straight down or, or straight out to the side, keeping your hand in the same position and just moving the palm to face a different direction. So that if it's your arm, it's just rotating at the shoulder with your palm going up and down while your arm is straight or your leg you're rotating so your toes go out and inward. That would be lateral rotation or medial rotation. Supination and pronation is specific to the hand. When you turn your palm to face upward or forward, that is supination. When you turn your palm over, that is pronation. We naturally hold our hands at the sides in a pronated position, then supinate when we want to turn our palm over to hold something in our hand. Here we see an example of supination and pronation. The terms listed here are specific for motions that occur at the ankle joint. Inversion and eversion are about moving the foot side to side. Moving the foot laterally so the arch is angled downward and the lateral surface of the foot rises up is called eversion. When you rotate your foot so the lateral surface is downward and the soles of your feet are facing medially, that is inversion. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are about moving your foot up and down. Lifting your toes up with your heels down is dorsiflexion. Pointing your toes down like a ballerina is plantar flexion. Elevation is to move a body part superiorly, like closing your mouth or lifting your shoulders. Depression is lowering a body part, like the motion of your jaw when you open your mouth or dropping your shoulders down. Here we can see elevation and depression. Protraction occurs when you move your head forward, keeping your jaw at the same plane. Just jutting forward is protraction, and then returning back is retraction, or motion in a posterior direction. Opposition and reposition are motions that occur with the fingers and thumb. Opposition is when you touch a finger to your thumb, like in a pinching motion. Reposition is moving your fingers and thumb away from each other. Here are the diagrams that summarize the motions of the body and limbs and additional diagrams for more specialized movements. For part two, you should be aware of the features of synovial joints, and for each of these features, you should know its function. The features are listed here. You should also know the types of joints and an example of each, as well as the terms of movement and what those motions represent. Now we'll finish our joint lecture with looking more deeply into some specific joints. The shoulder, hip, and knee. The upper limb is attached to the torso or thorax at the sternoclavicular joint. The acromioclavicular joint connects the stabilizing clavicle to the movable scapula. The scapula and clavicle are anchored primarily by muscles with the one skeletal connection at the manubrium of the sternum. The main joint that we think of when we think of our shoulder joint is called the glenohumeral joint. 
The glenohumeral joint is a standard ball and socket joint with a very wide range of motion. The round head of the humerus is cupped by the glenoid fossa of the scapula. This joint can flex, extend, abduct, adduct, rotate, and circumduct. There are many muscles that contribute to eliciting these motions at this joint, but the musculature is just one of the primary ways to increase the stability of this joint. In this x-ray, we can see the nice relationship between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. On the right, we can see that this joint and its associated structures are surrounded by a synovial membrane that includes the joint capsule itself, as well as tendon sheaths and bursa. The shallow glenoid fossa is made up to 50% deeper by a thickened fibrocartilage rim around the fossa. This cups the head of the humerus and makes the joint much more stable. Notice that the long head of the biceps brachii attach at the superior region of the glenoid fossa and the end of the tendon is actually fused with the labrum. Several ligaments contribute to the stability of this joint, but keep in mind that muscle strength is the greatest protection for dislocation. This joint has such a wide range of motion with little bony stability. In this diagram, we can see several bursa that protect the many tendons and ligaments that traverse this complex joint. We will not need to name any of the bursa. I just want you to know what a bursa is and which joints are associated with having bursa. Rotator cuff muscles are a set of four muscles that originate on the scapula and insert lateral to the head of the humerus, essentially holding it in the socket. The rotator cuff muscles each have specific movements based on their location and how they pull on the humerus, but their primary role is stabilization of this joint and just a small contribution to the movements often ascribed to them. These four muscles are mostly named for their position on the scapula. Supraspinatus lies above the spine of the scapula, shown in red. Infraspinata lies below the spine of the scapula and is shown in green. Teres minor is in blue and it runs along the inferior side of infraspinatus. Subscapularis is the final muscle along the underside of the scapula, not seen in this image because that's the side facing the rib cage. From this view on the left, we can see subscapularis in yellow. Again, we see the other three muscles on the right from the posterior view. A way to remember these muscles is the acronym SITS, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. The joints in the lower limb begin in the pelvic girdle. There's not a lot of motion in these three joints. Lumbosacral attaches the lowest lumbar vertebrae to the sacrum that forms the posterior portion of the pelvic girdle. Sacroiliac joints are where the two sides of the pelvis, specifically the ilium, attach to the axial skeleton. Anteriorly, the two pubic bones connect at the pubic symphysis. The distal three joints have much more movement. We'll discuss the coxal or hip joint and go into more detail about the tibial femoral or knee joint. There won't be any more detail provided about the tibio talar or ankle joint in this lecture. The hip joint is another ball and socket joint, similar to the shoulder joint, but much, much more stable. This increased stability comes at the cost of a reduced range of motion for all of the motions indicated. The acetabulum is a deep socket fitting the majority of the round head of the femur. The deep bony socket of the acetabulum is enhanced by a strong fibrocartilage ring to help cup the head of the femur within but allow movement. The orientation of supporting ligaments allow for a much greater anterior flexion movements and a more limited range of motion for the extension movements or moving the leg backward. Inside the socket itself, the center of the head of the femur has this ligamentum teres. This attaches the femur directly to the pelvis in addition to providing a conduit containing vessels and nerves into the head of the femur. The three ligaments that wrap around from posterior to anterior are named for the bony parts they connect, which includes all three bones of the oxa coxa to the femur. 
The tibiofemoral joint is a fancy name for knee joint. The condylar ends of the femur articulate with the flat superior surface of the tibia. Our knees hold most of our body weight and must withstand high shear and torsional forces. Therefore, it has several ligaments to hold it in place and prevent excessive motion in multiple directions. Locking is a mechanism that allows the knee to remain in the position of full extension without much muscular effort. Locking occurs as a result of a medial rotation of the femur during the last stage of extension. On the end of the femur, the condyles are much larger on the medial side, meaning that when the lateral side, when you extend your knee, the lateral side is done, but the medial side will actually continue to rotate a little bit more. This means that when you go from the knee bent to straightening it, the lateral surface reaches the end of its motion before the medial surface does. Being in a seated position, you can extend your leg outward. At the point that your lateral condyle reaches the end of its range of motion, continue to contract your quadricep muscle and you'll notice that with your thigh stationary against the chair, your lower leg will actually rotate slightly outward. That's because the medial surface continues to rotate a little bit more. However, if you are standing up and you lock your knees into place, you'll notice that your actual femur or your knee kind of turns inward. The menisci within the knee are two crescent-shaped fibrocartilage discs that are wide on the lateral surface and tapered down toward the middle. These cup each femoral condyle holding the femur in alignment during flexion, extension, and that slight medial rotation of the knee. Cruciate ligaments are inside the knee joint to prevent anterior or posterior motion of the femur relative to the tibia. These ligaments are named from when they attach on the tibia. The anterior cruciate ligament can be seen under the patella on the anterior side of the knee. It starts on the tibia and moves superior and posterior to attach to the femur. The anterior cruciate ligament, indicated in blue, prevents the tibia from moving anterior as well as the femur from moving posterior. In green, the posterior ligament begins on the tibia at the posterior side and goes up and anteriorly to attach to the femur. This prevents the femur from moving too far forward when the tibia is stationary or prevents the tibia from moving backward relative to the femur. Surrounding the knee joint are structural ligaments that support the joint capsule. The patellar on the anterior side the collaterals on the two sides, and the popliteals on the posterior surface. The patellar ligament is an extension of the quadriceps tendon. The quadriceps femoris is the muscle on the anterior thigh. A tendon is a muscle to bone connection. So in blue, we see the segment that is the tendon after it leaves the quadriceps femoris muscle and attaches to the superior portion of the patella, which is bone. A ligament is a bone-to-bone -bone connection. Therefore, the segment from the patella attaching inferiorly to the anterior surface of the tibia is the patellar ligament. The collateral ligaments are along the sides of the knees. The medial collateral ligament can also be referred to as the tibial collateral ligament as it attaches from the femur to the tibia on the inside of the knee. The lateral collateral ligament is also referred to as the fibular collateral ligament because of the femur to fibula attachment. These ligaments prevent side-to-side -side dislocation. Injury to a collateral ligament often occurs on the opposite side of impact. The side that gets hit will actually buckle and go slack, while it is the opposite side that will expand, tearing the ligament. The back of the knee is supported by the oblique popliteal ligament with directional fibers that go in and at an angle. The oblique popliteal ligament prevents hyperextension. The arcuate ligament is part of the posterior lateral ligament complex in most people, but it's actually absent in approximately 30 to 35% of people. 
This is Y-shaped in that it starts from the fibular head and splits extending outward toward the oblique popliteal ligament. Here are all the ligaments that we covered. Pause a moment to identify each of these ligaments on the diagram. What you should know now for the specific joints are the glenohumeral joint, range of movements or motions, and the factors that increase its stability, including the labrum and ligaments, as well as you should know the rotator cuff muscles, specifically their names and locations. For the hip joint, you should compare it to the shoulder, also understand its supporting ligaments and its range of motion and its structural features. You should know the knee joint fig features and most importantly, the ligaments.